Hey everybody, um, so thank you for staying with us through this long and exciting day. Um, our last session right now is really about uplifting your teaching profession um, and thinking about ways that, again, that the community can get involved. And so our first speaker is Ms. Kimberly Eckert. She is the president of Educators Rising Louisiana, which is dedicated to rebranding the societal view of what it means to teach and recruiting the next generation of teachers. Uh, she's also the 2018 Louisiana Teacher of the Year. So please welcome Ms. Kimberly Eckert. Hi there. I did it, I totally made it. So the bad news, it took me eight hours to get here from Mobile, which is a lot. But the good news is that while I was there, um, we managed to give 100 scholarships to paraprofessionals to start a bachelor's degree so they can be teachers. That's so cool! Great, what's also kind of fun is that Meanwhile, during my second hour class, I had to like give sub plans because my sub didn't show up. So how does a person go from that, like I'm teaching, right, but also giving 100 scholarships away in Mobile, Alabama? So together, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And it is not awesome me that you really just wanna eat and talk to your friends. I'm gonna do the best I can because at the end of the day, I'm a teacher and I don't have an ego and I teach freshmen. <laughs> so let's go. All right. Um, first of all, I can't thank you enough for just being here. This is the coolest thing ever. Whenever Dr. Barber told me that you were having this event, I just wish everybody everywhere could attend an event like this. So I just can't thank you enough uh, for showing up for kids and for showing up for teachers and for showing up for education. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. The most important thing to know about me is that I'm a teacher, but I'm also going to tell you about the different hats that I wear because it's a lot of hats. Uh, it's, it's a lot of hats, but the work is so urgent. And I get to affect kids and teachers in so many different ways. And I will never turn away from an opportunity to be able to do either of those things. So in addition to teaching in West Baton Rouge, um, I still work in central office as the innovative programs coordinator. That's like my side extra job. So I can work on programs like Educators Rising. And then my main job is I'm the Dean of Undergraduate Studies at a university called REACH in Oxford Teachers College is the reason why we were able to raise all of this money through philanthropic dollars so that paraprofessionals can get a bachelor's degree, and it's really amazing. Uh, so yeah, lots of hats, but the thing is, I really love to teach, and one day I would love for all the things to be solved so I can teach all day once again. That would be a good day. Uh, I'm also a problem solver, and I think any great teacher is a really good problem solver. We think really quickly, and we find out what's wrong, and we fix it. It's what we do. And then the last thing that you probably need to know about me is I'm a really idealistic realist. So everything that we're gonna talk about today it's gonna sort of frame it and like, what can a person do about a problem that seems so big that we can't solve it? And it's important to understand sort of my beginnings. I'm from Marksville, the, the Bayou, right? And neither of my parents actually graduated from high school. Uh, they dropped out, and by the time they were 19, they had three babies uh, on a bayou. And that's really important. It's an important part of my identity. It's also an important part of why I never became a teacher initially. It was actually a social worker, because I actually felt that teachers were too elite for me. Like, I can't be a teacher. The teachers are important and they're prestigious. And I still believe that. But now I believe that, that that's probably a flaw in the system that led me to take a long way around, where I didn't see myself in a classroom leading it, being a teacher. So this is what I'm going to share with you, because I think you're in this space and you're probably really good at your day job. And it can give us tension to think of a problem as big as elevating the teaching profession or fixing a teacher pipeline that's been cracking for decades. But we take a look at Helen Keller, and I think about this quote, and I've been saying it to myself since I was little, ever since I was working at Piggly Wiggly as a wee young lass, that I long to accomplish a great and noble task, but my chief duty is to accomplish small tasks as though they're great and noble. And that drives everything that I do, whether it was working at Piggly Wiggly, or it's being a teacher, or it's figuring out how I can help the community, how I can help kids, how I can help move our country in any direction um, that feels like it's the right direction. So that's what I'm gonna share with you. You just have to start where you are, wherever it is. If you're teaching, keep doing that, right? And those who can't teach, do something that helps teachers. And that's the most effective thing you can possibly do. So here's where we're gonna probably talk about a lot of things that you already knew from today. 
Uh, you've probably been talking about this a great deal. I know that United Way actually posted on their Facebook page something that's pretty compelling. Like in Louisiana, there was a drop. I think a 30% reduction of people entering, like aspiring teachers. But we also know that this is a national issue, so we're going to go through this really quickly. Because even though we're a room full of solutions, we can never lose sight of the problem. We can never take our eyes off the ball. So yes, there's a 35% drop in teacher prep programs. There's not a 35% drop in children. Like we still have the same amount of kids being born, right? But we're far less that are equipped to be able to handle their education. We also know that we've got some diversity issues in our pipeline. We know that over half students in public school are represented beautiful walks of life and diversity. And we know that we don't see that reflected in our pipeline. And that's critical for all students, not just students of color. We know that there's key shortages in content areas like special education and STEM. So these are things that are real, right? So then we start to think, like, how do you solve a problem? You identify it. What if we recruited and we did it on purpose? And we actually recruited to the needs that we have, not for the needs that we romanticize or fantasize about. So if we we're going to do this right, and we can actually look to young people that are in our classrooms today, what if we told them all the things that make teaching challenging, that we embrace that, that we tell them that only the greatest teachers can really get the job done, and only the greatest students and the greatest leaders and the greatest of the schools currently can be a great teacher? That's not a secret. So what if we did it that way? So we're also at a point, and this is very interesting, and it's the smallest part of where you could come in. There was a poll done in 2019 that over 50% of parents now actively discourage their kids from becoming teachers. Ooh, that's heavy, right? Uh, the same poll was released the following year, and over 50% of teachers discourage kids from becoming teachers. Real talk, right? So we have to look at all the reasons why. Why is that? Why is that that the ones that are in the profession and haven't quit yet are actively discouraging the next generation from being in the same shoes as them? That's a flaw. That's a problem community-wide. That's not a teacher problem. That's a problem that no profession should ever face, where the people who are doing the work tell those coming behind, don't come here, you don't want any of this. So we think about the idea of elevating the teaching profession but I do want you to know that this isn't just a Lafayette problem or a Louisiana problem or an American problem. This is a global problem. So we'll take a look at sort of the way we identify talent in schools. So this is a doctor. And it's important to note that by 2030, the United Nations, the UN, they have these sustainable development goals. And it covers everything from poverty to infrastructure. And global education is one of the problems that's identified. It's goal number four. And they've identified that by 4.5, 2030, 4.3 million doctors will be needed. So it will be short 4 million. That's intense. That's a lot. Mostly in developing countries. Similarly, engineering. That's a big field that we push our high school students into. And for good reason. By 2030, there's going to be 2 million short of that, right? But that's also in developing countries. And I'm, I'm just going to put this here. That's a lawyer. And there's not a shortage of lawyers by 2030. <laughs> but it's so interesting. Um, and I, I'll, I'll make fun, and I think Dr. Roberts is here, and that's really funny. But I went to law school, so and where did that take me? <laughs> a long way around to teaching, which is what I really needed to do. So this is pretty telling, because if you ask high school students, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm like, don't grow up. That's the first mistake. But they're like, oh, a lawyer, I'm going to be pre-law. And we're like, yay, we're so, we don't need them there, right? So the first thing we need to do is take a look at what does the world actually need? 69 million teachers by 2030. Just want to go back to this. We push kids into these pathways, right? Trying to get them ready for the needs of the world. But the glaring and most obvious need is the teaching profession. And it's not lip service that we can't have any of the <laughs> professions. We can't have anything, profession or not, unless we tackle this problem. And so that is the spirit of this evening, right? Because now we have our eye on the wall, we see what needs to be done, and we know that we can be a part of it. So here's where we have to start looking at the way we talk about teaching, the way we message it, so that the population, so that parents and students don't just hear lip service. They're not stupid. 
So whenever we talk about the medical profession, right, and the bravery and the courage and the skill that it takes to save lives, in the next breath, we need to talk about the courage and the bravery and the skills that it takes to save the lives of students in our communities. It's the same. Please, go team. And also, we talk about the courage and the bravery and the skills it takes to blast off in the space, which I'm a big fan of a nerd. I would like to blast off in the space. But the courage and the skills and the bravery it takes to help students believe that they can reach new heights, that they can see new planets. That's skill, that's bravery, and that's courage. So we're going to switch gears a bit, and I'm going to talk to you a lot about Grow Your Own, a Grow Your Own program. So I was an English teacher all day long, but I was also an instructional coach. I just been 10 years as a coach, and I've never lost a teacher from the profession. That's cool. You should clap for me. <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. It's not easy. But because I was a coach, and because I was tasked with a lot of different programs, I also knew front and center that we had a shortage. I knew it very soon, very early, because I thought a school that had really high turnover. I had no business being like an instructional coach or a mentor or a master teacher my third year. I was just literally the only one left. So there you go, the secret of my success. So I started to research pretty early on, around 2010, like, whoa, we don't actually have a pipeline. Like, nobody's coming to job interviews. And we talked about like diversifying the teaching profession. We need more black people in the profession. Oh yeah, Southern graduated six people on the particular year that I was like, something has to be done now. So that means that nobody's entering. There's not enough. We have to start sooner. And we also know that it takes years to be a good teacher. So we cannot wait till 2030 to start a problem that takes such specialty, such expertise, that does not happen overnight. Not a single great teacher just falls out of the sky. The problem is that the best of us make it easy, but it's not. So you think about this, and this is a celebration. It gets way more positive from here. So we know so many things about what does work. We know that 60% of teachers, all of them, anywhere, they actually teach within 20 miles of where they grew up. Teachers want to be in their communities. That's a win. We know this, and we should use that. So whenever we think about in this particular space, I started to look into Educators Rising because I just needed a better way for Ruby High School. I just needed to be great and noble at this one school where we could get maybe one extra teacher applying to be in our parish. I didn't think that three years later it would be a movement and not just a moment. I just knew we had this problem in this one school that I really needed to solve, and I wasn't going to wait for Superman to show up to solve it for me. And I'm a teacher, and we solve problems, and I'm really good at it. So, started to do lots of research, but it was the community around me that really helped me to move and to not be afraid and to troubleshoot and to solve problems. Because problems are big. Whenever you have something that's untested, nobody can tell you where the data is because it hasn't been done before. So the ability to really dig in and help people believe that it's to their advantage and their benefit to make the data with you, to take the leap with you. Because the worst thing you can do whenever there's a global teacher shortage is nothing. We cannot afford to do nothing. So when it comes to Educators Rising, which is the solution that UL has embraced and Lafayette Parish has really embraced, uh, the whole goal is to develop highly skilled teachers with this generation of students. So it actually turns all of education on its head, and that's why it appeals to kids. So what they see is a teacher lecturing, and they're like, I don't want to talk about history all day long. Well, neither do I. That sounds like it's terrible. What I do want to do is change lives, and I do want to be creative and brave, and I want to be innovative, and I want to excite people, and I want to motivate, and I want to, oh my gosh, empower and activate, mobilize, and all these things. I want to change a community. Kids need to know that that's what you can do, because we lose them to professions like social work, or sociology, or criminal justice, or law. We just need to turn their gaze and help them know that take your pick. Teaching is social justice. I'm never a harder social worker than I am as a teacher every single day. So the other really important thing to remember, and it's so special that it just so happens this generation is so attuned to the needs of the world because they're connected like never before. They know the world's needs, and they actually don't trust adults to get the job done. So all these elements 
to things that are very important to, number one, teenagers of today, but also teachers, really great teachers and school administrators. These are conversations that we have every day. How do we close gaps? Close the skill gap for teachers. So these things are so transparent for students that they become hungry and they want to, they want to pull the curtain back. And they're like, oh, how teaching's hard. Cat me in. Deal me in. Put me in the game, coach. So that's what we have the opportunity to do. <laughs> it's also important to understand, and in Louisiana, it's mirroring this exact thing. So if we talk about the other problem, the lack of diversity in the profession, there's room for everyone. We're in global shortage, right? Let's recruit on purpose. So nationally, Educators Rising is doing this. And then we look at our membership from Alaska to Louisiana to New York to New Mexico, over 50% of the students who are enrolled in the classes or the clubs represent beautiful diversity of our country. And that's beautiful. I mean, that's amazing. And we're seeing the same trends in Louisiana. And it's not accidental. We did it on purpose. So the way that we're recruiting, and this is another piece, another lift that you can do, is whenever you see students that have the dispositions that we know great teachers have, tell them, and tell them that's what's gonna make them a good teacher. We cannot lose them. We can have an accountant from the kids who don't have these skills. They can have them. But if we see kids with these incredible skills, these are the things that are hard to teach. I can coach a good teacher out of almost anything, and I have. However, if they come with some of this, it makes my job so much easier. Do you like collaborating? Are you a leader? Are you a bridge builder? Are you curious? Are you a whippersnapper? Like, I want students who are handful because I need them changing a system that's broken when they grow up, right? So these are the things we look for. And what's exciting is that it doesn't always look like the teacher of the 1950s. And that's something that we have to be brave enough to face. It doesn't look like maybe our teachers looked, but that's the point. Look for this first, and everything else is going to fall into place. So this picture is super special because it comes from my students in a community event. Uh, it wasn't like this, but I'm gonna steal this thing for next year. Um, but this is like the mayor of Brewley, and there's other business leaders within here, and he's talking to one of my students, and she's talking to him about equity and barriers and education, and this kid's 16 in this picture. But that community showed up, and they were listening to these children with nothing but respect, and the kids, they knew at that point more about education than many teachers, many people that I've ever met. And the goal of this class, if you can graduate and be an informed voter, and you know about education as a citizen, think of the parent you'll be, right? Think of the activist you might be. Think of the person who might show up to Bessie, right? And actually know what they're talking about. And so this was this idea in action, and the community really showed up and embraced this. I think the entire Chamber of Commerce was there for this particular event. The only other thing that I'm going to really show you, because I want to keep it centered, that I never intended to be in Mobile recruiting their teachers today. I just wanted my school to look better and to have a better shot four years from the day that we planted the seed. So in the very beginning, I couldn't get anybody to take this class. We offered pizza, which was demeaning, and it chopped my integrity, but not even with pizza would you like to be my coworker. But that was a little uh, upsetting. But we did change the method of the way that we recruited. And this is what was so promising about this class in 2018 and why it's grown so fast. So overall, only 21 kids. And at the very beginning, only three were interested in teaching at all. We didn't have any solid lessons. We had, mm, if other things don't work out, that was the best we could do, we had three of those. But by the end of the year, we had 17 not only interested in teaching, but they actually signed on to schools of ed, and those students are in their junior year. They've actually gone on to start Educators Rising programs on their campuses. We ended up with so many more teachers that are gonna come back to us now one year from today. And we couldn't see those results, but we knew we had to try. And we knew that one teacher was better than none. But we had really great results. It's also really important to note that in the very beginning, we had one student of color who was interested in teaching. That's also part of the stat three. And by the end, we had 10. That's a huge win. You should probably clap for that. <laughs> so we're gonna sort of close. And it's really just to remind you, sometimes you don't need to look to 2030. Like, what can you do tomorrow? And it's just move. One step in front of the other, just start. The worst thing you can do is not start. The worst action is inaction. 
in action, still kind of in action. But if we take a look here, I just want you to see what this one class was capable of. One teacher, one class, one school, one state. And that's power. That's what happens whenever you unite and you collaborate and you figure out problems together. And you know that you've got a team and the load's much lighter when you've got many hands lifting it. Would we be able to hit it? Press play, literally hit it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm tired and I adult less and less as the day we're on. They really truly are. And I need you to know just a few things that they've done, and then we're gonna conclude. But this is Kennedy. Whenever I put Kennedy in that class four years ago, she was a jumpstart student. She was in trouble all the time. In fact, I put her in the class because I'm like, girl, what's gonna happen if you're not in my English class anymore? Like, you know, I'm gonna school again. I'm not putting my off again. So literally, I forced the child into the class. She put herself back on tops. She's now a sophomore at Southern, and she's going to be a pre-K teacher. <laughs> and she's still a handful, and I think that's the best part of all. Uh, this is Keegan. Very similar situation. Um, he's actually still a Jumpstart student, and he has an entire plan. He signed with the military for a few years, but he is probably the best tutor that we've got. Uh, the kids love him at the elementary school that he tutors at every day, where he makes 13 bucks an hour, and he's a teenager. That's pretty cool, right? Ah, and this is another group of students. Uh, they wanted to learn more about the Cato Prison Pipeline, so we went to Angola, and we asked the offenders, and they shared their education experiences, and those children designed that experience. And then this is a, a different group of students who were there the day that the pathway for the pre-educator um, pathway got passed, and they testified. And I think about the incredible teachers and leaders they will be because that building is their building. They'll never feel like they don't belong in that space. They'll never feel like they don't belong in rooms where decisions are made. And I think that's probably half the battle whenever we look at retention. So from here, this is my second hour. <laughs> um, and I want to remind you that my kids are extraordinary. They're unique, but they're not special. They're in every classroom in the world. We just have to find them and tell them to be a teacher. Yeah. So now, <laughs> the best part of the evening. Ta -da! <laughs> okay, I'll pull it together. Don't think it's commenced again. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about Ronnie, and you already met him probably several times today. Um, go team! Thanks so much for like having my back. What's pretty cool about him is that he is a product of the community that. Uh, that he was raised in and that he went to school. He's going to tell you a little bit more about that, but he works at the school that he graduated from. Um, he's a raging Cajun. He played ball here. He's a principal. He started off as a special education teacher. He's a friend. He now, oh, I'm such a recruiter. I've got a problem. He now teaches special education uh, for the, the college that I was telling you about. Nothing but the best for our paras. He makes it really proud. So I think that oftentimes we need to let people tell their own story because they can tell it a lot better. So as he gets ready to come up and share his wisdom and brilliance with you, we're going to listen to him talk a little bit about the work he does, and you're going to see how special his emphasis on community truly is. Hello, my name is Ronnie Wayne Harvey Jr. As a student, alum, teacher, and now school leader at Washington Marion Magnet High School, I have always been passionate about shifting the school's climate and culture while empowering the North Lake Charles community. As a child, I attended all feeder schools within the community that led me to being a graduate of Washington Marion. During that time, I learned that you do not have to be the results of what your environment has to offer, but instead be the solution to any problems that exist. As an adult upon graduating from college, I immediately returned to Washington Marion as a classroom teacher, advocate, and resident in the community. Since my appointment as principal, we have been able to accomplish some great feats such as increasing the amount of certified teachers on campus, 
millions of dollars awarded in scholarships to our graduating seniors and a significant boost in parent participation, along with the monumental result of nearly a 15 point increase in school performance score, pushing our school letter grade from a D to a B in just one year. As a school leader, I welcome the task of wearing many hats as I understand the importance of the impact we have on students and their life beyond graduation. Another hat was needed in the year of 2020 as all stakeholders of my school and community continue to deal with the global pandemic of COVID-19, but also with the devastation of hurricanes Laura and Delta, which occurred within 50 days apart from each other. We have initiated many programs that aim at building a better relationship with our school and community in mind, such as coffee and conversations with the principal, which acts as a discussion board to bring the issues that impacts both entities. We have also established a monthly walk and talk with the principal that aims to better health and communication for all stakeholders. The model is to move Washington Marion High School and the North Lake Charles community forward, onward, and upward. So whenever I watch that, and I think about COVID and then the devastation of the hurricanes and how most of us could barely just wake up some days, you have school leaders like Mr. Harvey who were invested in making it even better than it was before. Like finding the strength to function and be well and be with his family and make a school better. So I would like you to now join me as your jambalaya got cold. Join me in welcoming your 2022 Louisiana High School Principal of the Year, Ronnie Harvey! Yes, SPS is a nightmare sometimes. 
Okay? But at the same time, why are you in the profession from the beginning? Okay? And my thing is, how did I get there? So people say, man, you always help me, you always positive. Yes, I remember my why. My why doesn't stop a parent from coming and curse me out. My why doesn't stop people from talking about me or my vision on social media. That's when you have to take the time and properly prepare for what's to come. So when I talk about the proper preparation, I tell people all the time, there's five P's. Proper preparation will always prevent a bad point. Again, the proper preparation will always prevent a poor performance. Some things we cannot prepare for, but it's not that we can't prepare for it. We didn't intentionally prepare for that particular matter. Like, I can't remember who said it earlier, but we were all struck by the pandemic, right? So it was no way of us being able to say, hey, the government is going to shut down the country on March 13, 2020, and every student should have a one-to-one -one technology device in their hand, and boom, education is going to be just as great as it ever been before. That didn't work, right? Okay, so let me be transparent with you. Anybody here from college should Good, so don't try to tell on me, okay? <laughs> so here we go. In college, we actually have a plan because my school is a Title I school, so my students in my school were already one-to-one. -one. But here's the problem. There's no hotspot inside that one-on-one -on -one device, right? Not only was there no hotspot, but you had to understand we were going through a global pandemic, and in August of 2020, the unthinkable happened. Hurricane Laura came to visit us. So it didn't even matter if you was one-to-one -one from a technology standpoint. You didn't have anywhere to go power that particular laptop. Not only did you not have nowhere to go power that particular laptop, but you had no roof to shelter you from the elements. So I say to you, proper preparation prevents a poor performance. What would we have done better in that situation? Well, first of all, absolutely nothing. The only thing we could have done at that particular point was just stay positive, remain hopeful, and remember our why. Because as Mr. Tommy Bala just said, I wish I had that magic wand too. I really do. Matter of fact, I wish I had several of them. Because sometimes I need a magic wand, and then a magic wand fixes what didn't have the first magic wand. But what I'm saying is, you've got to go back and be properly prepared. Because here's what's going to happen. The storms are going to come. We talk about the storms. Yes, I'm from Calvary, so you heard of Laura, and then you heard of a good friend, Delta, saying, hey, y'all haven't gotten deep enough enough. I'm coming back to this issue. And when I come this time, I'm going to bring more rain, more water, and yes, I know y'all have blue sparks on your room, on your roof, but hey, I'm coming to bring Make sure you're extra well. So when we talk about overcoming the storms, I've learned more during the storm than I've ever learned in my entire life. You know why? Because for one, I realized I was already prepared for the storm. Now, I'm not going to go biblical, but I am a big faith guy, and my faith is always bigger than my fear. So I have to tell myself, man, if you're walking in the storms, it's simple. Remember your why. Your goal is to improve the efforts of humans. It's to make the lives of humans better. That's my why. Not just in education, but overall. Even from the community standpoint. Many people constantly hear me say, my goal is to shift the climate and culture of Washington, Mary, and Magnet High School while empowering the community at the same time. That's just not something that just sounds good for me to say. It's what I truly aspire to do. And when I say that, it's because we have to translate this to our personal life. Yes, we had the storms come, but how many of us in education have storms that happen to us in our daily life? And I'm not just talking about the weather. See, when you talk about proper preparation, you always have to anticipate that something is going to happen. Somebody said it earlier when we had a panel earlier, they said, hey, you know, there's so anything that you can do. You can just give up and quit, or you can just keep on going. I don't know about you all, but as an educator, I'm going to always keep on going. You know why? Because I'm responsible for grooming the next Ronnie Hart. And the person after that, and then the person after that, I have to go back and remember why I'm doing it in the first place. So when we talk about the storms and things like that, what do you do when you get ready for the storm? So when you've been through the storm, you know, we go out and we try to buy all the groceries, we try to buy toilet paper, we try to buy all the water, we try to do everything. But what if you know the storm is coming? What if the weatherman was wrong that day? What if the meteorologist was way off like they'd be in Lake Charles? Okay? And they would tell us, don't worry, say, there's no snow today, and it's 80 degrees outside. No knock on the weatherman. But what I'm saying is, what do you do when the storms of life happen? What do you do when the storms of education happen? What do you do when the people who are not 
educators, but they're the experts, as someone said earlier, and they make a budget that you have to stay with them, but they're not in the trenches like you. What do you do? Can't just send people home. Can't just shut down schools. You have to keep on going. And when I say that, you have to realize that you were already properly prepared to handle the situation. There was nothing that a university could have taught you. There was nothing that a teacher preparation program could have taught you. It was already within you because you have a why of the reason why you're in education. So I like to tell people my story. See, my story is a little bit different because my storm actually happened when I was 26 years of age. I was a young educator, recent graduate of the University of Louisiana Lafayette. Yes, I am a raging Cajun. Okay. But there you go. When telling, out, when telling my story, I like to tell people the storm occurred to me, but I, really, I, couldn't, I couldn't call FEMA. My storm happened in my life. FEMA wasn't available. I couldn't call my insurance agent. I couldn't call my adjuster. There was no one who could actually help me that was right in front of me at the time, if that makes sense. So what is my storm? I'm a 26-year-old educator, and on the morning of October 6, 2008, I wake up with sudden sensory renewal bilateral hearing loss. If anyone don't know who, what that is or what it sounds like, it's like when you wake up in the morning, and you're ready to go to work, and it sounds like this. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. I'm talking about I don't even hear the air conditioning on. I don't hear my wife talking to me. I don't hear absolutely anything. I realized at that moment I was getting ready to go through a storm. And then what? Nobody warned me. Nobody said, hey man, if you watch Monday Night Football, you go to sleep Tuesday morning, you're going to wake up and you would never hear nothing again. Nobody told me that. I wasn't warned. But actually, I had to go back to remembering my what? My why, right? Because when I talk about the five Ps, I'm not saying the five Ps because it sounds good. I'm saying the five Ps because I really have been prepared to handle my storm. Why had you been prepared? Well, how can you prepare to handle bilateral hearing loss? What in the world prepared you for that moment? See, what people didn't even realize was back in spring of 2005, graduated from the University of Louisiana Lafayette with a Bachelor of Arts in Arts, Speech Pathology and Audiology. <laughs> so when I go back and people are like, man, why aren't you working as a speech pathologist? Why aren't you working in the audiology field? I don't know, I just want to coach. I just want to go help young people. I just want to go teach. I want to teach kids that's in special education because those kids need us more than anything. We have to be their voice. But go back to it, I was already properly prepared to handle my storm. See, sometimes you don't have to go look at wood. Sometimes you don't have to go Google. Sometimes you don't have to go YouTube. It's already within you. So I, live, I constantly hear people say this over and over again. We got to figure out this. We have to figure out that. We got to figure out that. We got to create this. But no, it's already within us. What it's going to take is summits like this, where we can come together collectively and collaborate share each other's voices, but elevate everyone's voices in the field of education so we can do what's best for the child. It's already in us. We don't have to go looking far. It's right here in us. So come back. Go back to my story. At that time, I'm being completely deaf. Okay? Can't hear anything. Can't talk to my wife. Can't do anything. Hey, we literally text message. Literally. We sit on side each other, but we text back and forth. And I said, we text her back and forth, but she's actually texting me her response. I'm talking to her because I still have a voice. I can still articulate what I have to say. But at that time, I'm a thug guy, okay? I'm a proud guy, okay? I go, when we go to all the hours, I'm like, hey, man, I don't have time for this. I got practice tomorrow. Just give me two here and I'm talking to her. Literally. He starts laughing at me. He's like, I don't think you understand what just happened to you. I'm like, no. Nah. Listen to me. Let me, let me say this back to you. While you're writing, I'm already answering it back to you. I get it, man. I seen the audiogram. Yes, the audiogram is on the downward curve and I'm missing decibels and things like that. But at the end of the day, I have things to do. I have to go impact children. Even in the midst of my storm, I didn't forget my why. It was always bigger than Ronnie Barb. It was never about me. It was about the children. And I'm a big believer. So I'm like, hey, the same way it was taken away from me, the same way you can give it back to me. But what I didn't realize, it was never taken away from me. It was paused. It was paused. And the reason why it was paused is because I think the higher authority 
just wanted me to realize my vision. He wanted me to see what was really your why. He wanted to test me during the storm. And in the midst of the storm, I went back to my wife. Why am I doing it? I wanted to get back to the children now more than ever. I wanted to be a better coach. I wanted to be a better father. I wanted to be a better husband. I wanted to be a better administrator. I wanted to be all those things, but some of them I hadn't even become yet. So at the time, I wasn't even a father. At the time, I wasn't an administrator. So you think about wanting to be all of those things that you can't even hear. If your baby were crying, you're not even going to hear it. How can you be an administrator and lead people when you cannot even hear what they're saying? I had to go back and remember my why because that's where my strength really was. I had to go back and remember that five years at the University of Louisiana Lafayette, I had already been preparing for that particular moment. See, sometimes we spend a lot of time preparing for a moment because we're thinking about the momentum stage. Sometimes it's just a basic stage of life to get you from second to second to second to second. Sometimes you gotta realize, you have to really realize that it's already in you. I'm listening to the conversations today. We gotta figure this out, we gotta figure this out. We gotta, we gotta do this, we gotta do that. They don't understand, who is they? Now we all educators. And like I tell people in my building, I'm nothing more than a co-leader. Because see, the janitor have the same amount of power as I do. I clean the toilets. I'm sorry. Yes, we have a teacher shortage. So listen, all I can tell you, she's a math person. I'm not a math person. I can tell you right now, I struggle on the calculator. Okay? That's why I'm going to put the house because we would be in trouble. But at the same time, it doesn't matter. I'm going to go and do whatever is needed to get us over the home. So fast forward through my journey. Hearing aids, I don't know if you know anything about hearing aids, but hearing aids does not give you the ability to hear. Hearing aids only amplifies the sound. So if you lose sound, you basically sound like, yeah, I understand what you're saying. But when they put the hearing aids on, it sounds like, yes, I have hearing aids now. So the clarity isn't there. The sound is there, but the clarity is there. So what difference does it make that you're hearing noise, but you're not able to understand the voice? Again, my faith is bigger than my fear. I understood my why, and I went back to my preparation programs, okay? Over the time, my hearing did return. It returned, and let me just say this. It returned, it returned, it returned, and this is what happened while it was returning slowly but surely. I was appointed for my first principal show. So we gathered in the front foyer. It was Christmas time, we were donated to a family, and all of a sudden, I'm talking to my faculty and my staff, and my voice goes, shh. Man, I must be sweating. My battery's dead. I gotta get another battery. What's it that though? I was experiencing hearing loss in years. So for the second time in less than 10 years, I suffered bilateral hearing loss again. It couldn't get any worse than that. I still had to remember my wife. So what did I do? Did I quit? Did I take a sabbatical? Did I do what the doctor said? Do and take an early or emergency retirement? No. I went. And I kept saying, the same way it was taken away from me, the same way it's going to be given back to me. My sound was not taken away from me. My hearing was not taken away from me. It was part so I could understand the greater vision. And I had to work harder to do what's best for children. Believe it or not, I continue to go to work. You know how some people say, you got to fake it? You got to fake it? My story is, I got to fake it until I make it. That's the difference. So I continue to go to work every day. I let my immediate staff know what was going on, and anybody who know anything about hearing loss, I kept my back to the wall. Because when I kept my back, keep my back to the wall, I became an avid uh, lip reader. Okay? I, even though I had never read lips before, even though I took a class in Dr. Barry campus on this class on this campus, and me being an athlete that I was, I didn't go to that class all the time. Being honest, I hope Dr. Barry, nobody knows Dr. Barry is. I skip this class all the time. I'm sitting right here in the unit. But that's another story. Okay? But what I'm saying is, is that I had to go back and just say, hey man, by any means necessary, you got to get it done. So I'm reading lips. I'm reading lips all day, and I'm faded. Nobody knows what's going on. They're like, oh man, I'm going to miss up. I thought somebody said he lost his hearing. Maybe he actually got it. Yeah, he's screaming. He's screaming because he can't tell how loud he's talking. But I'm hitting. And here's the thing what I had to do. As a principal, some principals in here can attest to this. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes on my campus, hey, I'm like, hey, I'm talking, you listen. I really use that, and it works. Because I'm like, hey, I'm talking, you listen. Yes, sir, Mr. Hart. 
So what it was, I'm getting most of the talking now. You listen, I'm like, all right, now I gotta go to the next one. But really, I'm not running away from you because I'm not trying to hold a conversation with you. Okay? So I say that to say, that continued to go on, and then I made the decision to get a car for the airplane. Let me just say this, in my understudies, I was totally against cochlear implants. Why? Because anybody who knows what a cochlear implant is, is when you cut the hearing nerve, and now you have to hear through the electrodes for the rest of your life. It's no coming back once they cut the hearing nerve. Okay? So, I'm not a big fan of it because it doesn't work for everyone. Okay? By the grace of God, I'll just say that. Okay? I was implanted in the spring of 2016. Okay? I went for my activation actually one week earlier because my wounds had healed up. Not to gross anybody out, but it's a gruesome surgery. I'm just going to tell you like that. You can YouTube it later. Okay? So, I said it to say, the audiologist in the room was telling my wife, she was saying, hey, you know, Mr. Harvey, he's such a great guy. Man, he's such a great guy. He's a positive guy. He doesn't deserve this. I can't believe this happened to him. Okay? And, you know, we want to we turn it on, but he's only going to probably hear weird noises and chipmunks on us. And I said, what do you mean I'm only going to hear the chipmunks on us? Some of y'all can catch that. <laughs> she asked me to realize she didn't know she turned it on. And I'm hearing better than her. So when I go back and I say, <laughs> when I go back and I say, you got to fade it till you made it, you got to remember your why. And despite the storm that you go through, you got to keep overcoming. You got to keep overcoming because the things you need to get to the the storm, whether it be your personal life or your professional life, you can't buy that on Vivo. You can't buy it at Walmart. It's already within you. You just have to remember your why. Now, let me get off myself a little bit. Because not only did I overcome all of that, but I'm sorry, y'all, and I'm a very humble guy. But I overcame all of that, not alone with a lot of people, a lot of help, a lot of collaboration. And not only did I overcome that and survive that storm, thrived in that storm. When I say I thrived in that storm, if nothing else, then I can stand before you and say, I went from a person, a regular teacher, who was not even here, to standing on a platform where I could probably say, I'm Louisiana's 2022 high school principal of the year. <laughs> So we have to figure out, that's been one of the questions tonight, how do we get the community involved? Those of you who, who may know about the Washington area and where we reside in, let me just say this, if you ever pass by Washington area on I-10, that community that surrounds Washington area is not my, where my students stay, okay? So those three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 homes, those are not where my kids stay, okay? You gotta cross the tracks and go across the highway, and then you can see where they really come from, okay? You're going through Lake Charles and you're coming across the I 10 bridge where you see all those blue FEMA tarps that's still our permanent roofing. That's what most of my kids are. Okay? So people say, well, man, you did all this, you did this award, you did this award, your school, bro, how did you do it? Yo, my goal was to shift the comedy and culture of the Washington area, but it was also to empower the community simultaneously. I didn't forget the community. Okay? So how did I do that? Many things. I say this all the time. Not just the, not just shifting the climate and culture in my school, but in education as well. See, in my community, education is not valued. In fact, I'm a first generation college graduate. I'm a first generation uh, applicant to college. Let me say, let me take a step forward. Not just to graduate, but to be to even, to even send the application in. Okay? So this is how I do it, y'all. Everything that I do, I don't just keep my students inside of 2802 in mind. I keep my community in mind as well. So the first thing we do, I started in high school, okay? Parent in high school. Now the first thing when I started parent in high school, they said, who do you think he is? You trying to give everybody a GED? No, I'm not trying to give you a GED. See, this is what I have to realize. As a principal and as a leader, and most of you guys in here can attest to that, you know, we always talk about parental involvement. We always talk about what they're not doing. We always talk about the type of parents you wish you had, okay? Y'all, I stopped that long ago. I started going to meet people where they are instead of expecting them where they're not. Go meet them where they are instead of expecting them where they're not. Because what you don't realize, we keep talking about parental involvement and supporting resources. Some of them do not know how to be parents. 
Wouldn't it be because they had parents hurting them? Or they just didn't work so much just to provide the simple resources for their students. So a parent in high school, simple things. We meet every month. Okay? We develop a little curriculum for I issue homework. Seriously. We had one last night. Okay? When I say I issue homework, I'm not trying to get them to go do algebra or U.S. history. I'm trying to get them to see the things that we're dealing with so they can go back and reteach that at home. I'm trying to show them a better way. I'm trying to, because here's the thing, it's a cycle. If I help you, guess what? You're going to help me if you just go home and do those simple things. So in my community, we go to parent high school by principal Paul Charles. So not only am I your kids principal doing the day, I'm your principal at night. I don't care if you have a master's degree, a doctor, I don't care what you do. You go to the night school. Okay? And I offer incentives, free dress day, I feed the kids, lunch with the principal, all kind of things. We take them on field trips. We just took uh, two groups of students in Houston, Texas. <laughs> Not people somewhere, man. They went to Houston, Texas for what? Because what you don't realize, the population that I deal with, the demographics, 70% of the people who boarded that charter bus had never left Lake Charles, Louisiana. So again, these are the things that I'm doing in my community. Not only do we do night school, okay, we do walk and talk. Now, people say, walk and talk. I'm a big guy, so I need all the exercises I can do. Okay? So what I constantly do, we just simply meet at the track, and as you can see a small tip in the picture right there, I do it differently. I meet with the males, and then I meet with the females. Okay? And we literally walk the neighborhood, just having a conversation. I'm not Principal Harvey, I'm Ryan. Because here's the case, I gotta take that hat off, because when I take that hat off, I get a different person. They see me for who I am. Not because of that. Oh, he's a principal, he's supposed to do that. So walk and talk happens. Now it happens with the females as well. Because that allows me to get insight on how to be a principal to young ladies. I tell my young ladies on my campus all the time, I've never been a female. Never, never even wanted to be one. But I know how to treat one. So I can't tell you how to be a better young lady if I've never been one before. I can tell you how you should be treated. But I can't tell you how to be one. Again, this is community efforts that we do every month. And it's, I don't think, I want to just invite state, I mean, uh, parents. I get the politicians, I get everybody. I get business owners, I get everything. And how silly to the business owners is that your customers. What better way to come advertise that market for free? I sell it to the pastors. You need to build your congregation? What better way to come recruit members? You can come and walk and talk. But then I also invite all the local physicians. Here's why. Because you can have a relationship with your client outside of the medical office just by simply walking and talking with them. Okay, again, community initiatives. The other thing that I do is conversations and coffee. Those of you who may follow me on social media you know what happened on yesterday. Okay, now, if you're going to take a time and go into conversations and coffee, you better feel you got to do your own for push ups before because you lie. So, Johnny Joe that you suspended on Monday. Mom's the first person to log on. She don't come for you, so you might want to have somebody on the side just edit in the comments. But at the same time, I take those bullets. I take them. I'm telling them. When they say something crazy, I be like, oh yeah, Ms. Mouton, how you doing? Thank you, Ms. Mouton, for that comment. You're right. I, as the principal, have to get better. I have to make sure that your child stop coming to school fighting every day. <laughs> so when they say that, they be like, did he just say that? Yes. See, here's the thing. I'm a transparent. I'm brutally blunt at times, but they get the picture. See, I understand they can throw darts at us, but whoever said we couldn't defend ourselves? Whoever said we could, we, we, we take darts all the time. I heard somebody say earlier, man, social media, they come for us. So why you can't be proactive and come for them too? Because here's the catch. What a, what a parent at Washington Marion would never be able to say, he doesn't communicate with us. Proactive versus reactive. We have to take those approaches. If we do things proactively, I guarantee you we won't be having a lot of conversations that we're having because I'm being you to the punch. My goal as a principal is I have to make sure, not literally, okay, so please don't put me on the news for this, but I have to make sure I punch my parents, my students, and my, and my stakeholders before they punch me. Those of you who are boxing fans, I don't know anybody who, will, who wins the championship and they never punch. They might dance like Mayweather, but they don't punch at some point. I'm going to punch you before you punch me. Because at least if I punch you first, you days, and you don't get all the information I give before you're trying to swing back at me. So I'm telling you again, do these type of things in the community, y'all, because I promise you, I'm not saying they guarantee the work, but they work for me. And I guarantee you the environment that I work in is something that's not even in 
comparison and some of the environments you were in. How did I get to this point? I didn't wake up and just think about this. I would remember my why. I have to get this another thing. I'm a kid. If you follow me on social media, you would think, man, he loves social media. I really don't. I really do not like social media, but I have to control the narrative. My thing is, I'm going to tell my story before you tell my story. You can, you, can, you can put all kinds of stuff in the book and say, oh, he this, he that, the school this, the school that. But if I beat you to the punch, keep telling my story. But the more I tell my own story, your story becomes opinions. This is formulating facts. See the difference? Again, I'm encouraging you, whether you're a business owner in this area or you're a, a, a central office person, this, let's just all come together. Let's go back and remember our why. Why are we doing it? And then once you remember your why, you can overcome any storm and any adversity that may encounter. Okay? Before I close out, I just want to say, if you answer social media, on my personal page, I'm Ronnie Harvey, our principal coach Harvey. I constantly post motivational stuff on that every single day. And again, it's, I just want you to be able to follow it and use it. I'm just trying to with you. That's all. Okay? I'm telling you about me. I'm letting you know who I am. And I'm trying to use my story so it can be a testimony and also so it can help you endure your story. Again, my name is Ronnie Harvey. I truly appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. A big thank you to our partners at Pew Family Foundation and UL College of Education and the team at United Way of Acadiana who has kind of put all of this together. A big thank you. We will be in touch. So go home and get a good night's rest and have a great weekend after tomorrow. Thank you all so much.